But um, uh, so I'm a lifelong commercial fisherman, born and raised in Newfoundland. And my life on the seas has been essentially a path of ecological redemption. I dropped out of high school when I was 14, headed out to sea. I fished the, the factory trawlers up in Alaska, tearing up entire ecosystems with our trawls. Then I, with, after the collapse of the cod stocks, I headed into the aquaculture industry, which was supposed to be the great answer to overfishing. And instead, we, we were growing salmon, halibut, um, uh, uh, and polluting local waterways using antibiotics. We used to say we were growing neither fish nor food. And essentially looking back, these were Iowa pig farms at sea. So then 10 years ago, I went on this search for sustainability. And I ended up in Long Island Sound. I began experimenting with new species, new ways to grow and farm in the ocean. And through a ton of trial and error, my life has mainly been a string of failures. I developed a new way to grow food. And I call it 3D ocean farming. Um, and the idea is to use the full water column to grow vertically, to grow a mix of restorative species, shellfish and seaweeds, for local food, but also fertilizers, animal feed, biofuel. Well, and while we're doing that, mitigating climate change and creating blue-green jobs. There we go. So here's a picture of the farm. One of our students drew this. Um, below the surface, and it's really simple, right? We don't have to fight gravity, so we just create a simple scaffolding system under the water. You've got hurricane-proof anchors going up to the surface. Across the top, about seven feet down, we have our line suspended by buoys, oyster cages at the bottom, and then clams down in the mud. Here's our kelp. It's kelp season right now. I've been harvesting nonstop. I'll be back in the boat tomorrow. We love kelp. It goes in post-hurricane season, which is key for New England, and it's, it's a, got a negative carbon footprint. Um, did I, and here's, our, yeah, he, here's our mussel socks, uh, which we grow on the same lines of, of the kelp, and our uh, scallops, which again, we, we hang on the same structure. We, we, lo we love mussels because they're um, packed full of omega-3s and lean, lean proteins. I'm just going to go like that. And then... Uh, uh, here's our oyster cages that sit on the sea floor. So here's the farm from the surface. And there's kind of nothing to see. And that's a really good thing. Mm. Our oceans are these beautiful, pristine places, and we want to keep them that way. We have a low aesthetic impact. Our farms, because we grow vertically, have a small footprint. I used to grow on 20 acres. I mean, 100 acres now, I'm down to 20, and I grow way more food than before. And anybody can boat, fish, and swim on our farm. We don't own the property. All we own is the right to grow shellfish and seaweeds. We own a process, not a property right. So, so that means what we're doing is protecting rather than privatizing um, uh, uh, the commons. And because our, taken as a whole, our farming is designed to really tread lightly. This is the beginning of a new agricultural system on our seas, and we want it to uh, tread lightly. So we, address, we uh, designed the farm to address three major challenges. First, we want to develop a delicious new seafood pl plate in the era of overfishing and food insecurity. So our goal is to invent this new native cuisine, not around the industrial palate, wild palate of salmon, of tuna, but instead uh, uh, by rearranging the, the um, ocean the seafood plate and moving bivalves to the center and sea greens. Um, uh, bivalves and sea greens in the center and wild fish to the edges. Because we think it's time to eat like fish. Fish don't make omega-3s and all these wonderful nutrients. They eat them. So by eating like fish, we get the benefits while reducing pressure on fish stocks. And we grow for diversity, a sea basket approach, two types of seaweeds, four kinds of shellfish, and we harvest salt at the same time. But we've barely broken the surface. This is the beginning of a hundred year journey. There are over 10,000 edible plants in the sea. And we only grow, and we basically grow none and we eat only a few. And imagine being a chef in 2016 and finding out that you've never even seen, let alone cooked with, new arugulas, lettuces, tomatoes for the first time. And we want our new, new seafood plate to be fun, creative. Last night we were cooking up barbecue kelp noodles with parsnips and breadcrumbs. This isn't seafood, these are vegetables. 
But our farms aren't these sort of bearded Brooklyn boutique-y things, right? We're trying to scale. We're actually trying to have an effect in the world. And um, uh, so our farms, we can grow an incredible amount of food. 25 tons of uh, seaweed, 250,000 shellfish per acre. A network of our farms totaling the size of Washington State could technically feed the world. And remember, this is zero input food. It takes no fresh water, no fertilizer, no feed, no arid land to grow, making it hands down the most sustainable form of food production on the planet. And in the era of climate change, as water prices go up, feed fertilizer prices go up, which is already happening, this will be the most affordable food on the planet. The economics are going to drive us to eat sea greens. The question is, is it going to be disgusting food like being force-fed cod liver oil or delicious and beautiful? Our second goal is to transform fishers into ocean farmers that are working to restore rather than deplete ocean ecosystems. The crops we grow are these powerful agents of sustainability. Our, um, our oysters filter up to 50 gallons of water a day, pulling nitrogen out of our oceans, which is the root cause of the spreading uh, dead zones. Our kelp soaks up to five times more carbon than land-based plants. It's called the sequoia of the sea. The New Yorker recently did an article and called it the cul culinary equivalent of the electric car. Kelp's also a powerful source of biofuel. The White House just hired a seaweed czar uh, because kelp yields five times more ethanol per acre than corn. Our farms also function as storm surge protectors and artificial reefs attracting over 150 species that come hide, thrive, and, and eat. My farm used to be a barren patch of ocean and now it's a thriving uh, ecosystem. So as former fishermen, we no longer have to pillage, right? chase the last fish. We're, we're now a generation of climate farmers helping grow a new climate cuisine. We're also using our crops, our zero input crops, to replace land-based feeds and fertilizers. So for example, if you feed cattle a majority diet of kelp, you get a 90% reduction in methane output and this delicious umami pack, slightly salty beef. The idea is to start building a bridge between land and seafood systems because too often our, our thinking really stops at the water's edge. Finally, we want to build the foundation of a new blue-green economy that puts jobs, justice, and rev uh, revival at the center of the plate. So we created Green Wave, which is a hybrid for-profit, non-profit, to do this spade work early on to make sure ocean agriculture serves both social and environmental needs. And we've got a three-legged strategy. We replicate our model, we build the infrastructure to go to scale, and we develop new markets for our farmers' crops. So to replicate and scale, what we did is we open source our model. We didn't franchise, we didn't patent, those are the tools of the old economy. What we did was open source so anybody with 20 acres in a boat uh, and $30,000 can start their own farm be growing the first year. Right? We built our systems around simplicity, not complexity, requiring low co capital costs and minimal skills. Affordable design is the recipe for, for quick replication. I think of it as the, the equivalent of the nail salon of the sea. So to get the farms off the ground, we have our tra farmer training program. Dave Blaney is an 11th generation former fisherman. Everybody gets a startup grant, two years of training, they get access to free seed, and we guarantee, and this is important, to buy 80% of their crops at triple the market rate for the first three to five uh, years. And this is key because as our farmers learn to grow, they don't have to suffer under financial insecurity. 91% of land-based farms in 2012 lost money. We don't want to recreate that in our new economy. We're bringing new folks into our new ocean innovation. We've got school to farm programs. We're, we're educating of sustainability programs with uh, young kids. We've got artists in, restaurant, uh, in residence. We got, uh, chef fellows, and underwater community gardens. The idea is to create a culture of creativity and open source sharing uh, uh, as we move out to sea. On land, we're working on the infrastructure. We've got seafood hubs, we've got hatcheries, we're building co-ops, and the idea is that farmers can capture more and more of the value chain. 
but we locate our land-based infrastructure in very strategic places. Not always the smartest places, but the best places, places that have been left behind by the old economy. We place them in poor neighborhoods uh, so that they, our infrastructure is an engine of food justice where good jobs, food access, nutrition are woven into the DNA of this new system. Lastly, we work on market development. We work with a whole range of different kinds of companies, innovators, um, uh, to increase demand for farmers' crops. And this means with Dr. Dish, we did a, um, a, sort of a fish trimmings, kelp burger. Google, we did a half beef burger, half kelp burger. We're, we're using kelp waste, uh, kelp waste as pet foods, fertilizers, working on new hatchery systems to lower energy costs. And taking together what, it looked, what Green Wave is trying to do is ours build reefs. We, we want 25 to 50 farms, a seafood hub, a hatchery, a ring of institutional buyers, and a ring of social entrepreneurs. And then we replicate that every 200 miles along our coast. Basically, wherever there's a Home Depot, we're gonna have a Green Wave reef. And the vision is of small-scale farms dotting our coastlines, surrounded by conservation zones in our oceans. Think of a Napa Valley of Marewar. That's where we're headed. But and in deeper waters, we want to embed our farms in, three, in uh, wind farms. Why just harvest wind? In these spaces, we can do food, fuel, fertilizers, and actually create an entirely new industry. So just to close, I mean, climate change is just throwing our entire food system into crisis. It's going to get worse and worse. I mean, if there's one lesson we should learn from the California water, uh, water wars last year is that our food system will be pushed out to sea. But the oceans are a blank slate, and we have this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to do food right, to build an ocean and agricultural system from uh, the bottom up, right? And use polyculture, not monoculture. Protect, not privatize our oceans. Invent entirely new occupations to feed the planet. So for me, the climate crisis forces me to innovate, to come together with others around a solutions-based approach to shrink the destructive economy, to grow the new economy. And this is the first chance I've had to participate in building a future where all of us can make a living on a living planet. Thanks. So I, we're doing questions, right? Yeah, so any questions? Hi. Hi. Um, so actually, I uh, love the like sustainable, holistic approach that your company has. Yeah. And I have a particular question about the artist in residence mm. component. Um, mm. I'm an artist myself, and I oh, was just fun. kind of curious in how that is integrated in your approach. Mm. So I mean, you know, seaweeds are disgusting, generally, especially to American cuisine, and we're trying to desuchify. We've got this native species right here, and part of that's art, arts and culture. So our, we have a, um, uh, an artist that's doing large installation pieces that are of the 3D farms, um, actually on land-based farms in their greenhouses in order to both make the connections between land and sea, but to bring people in through a cultural door rather than just a food and a sort of save fish oh, yeah. door. Yeah. I think that's great. That's like so important. Yeah. yeah. We love artists. They're essential. People don't think yeah. of them, but they should be at the table as yeah. we're trying to shift culture and prepare for the future. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, I'm wondering if you have thought about doing, I mean, I know that there's other kind of groups doing vegetable farming, kind of in that vertical ocean yeah. um, zone with the biodomes and that kind of stuff. Are you thinking about expanding into that beyond kelp and doing more yeah. fruits and vegetables yeah. in that space as well? So, um, I don't want to be, cr you know, I love my vertical ocean farm, I mean, uh, uh, land-based farmers, but I, I'm going to say this too strongly, but I think it's kind of dumb because you have to fight gravity. Underwater, we don't have to fight gravity, which makes it cheap, right? So, of course, we're going to build up and, uh, on land, but it misses this opportunity. And, um, uh, and the 10,000 edible plants, we can find the tomatoes. We can, if, you know, find the arugulas and the, the cucumbers under the sea as we, you know, no one's ever done a nutritional profile of even a thousand ocean plants. There's so little we don't know. So I think, um, uh, and then 
the zero input piece is also just a huge opportunity. So we still, they extremely, uh, some great water efficiency inside the vertical farm, great energy efficiency, but we just don't have any of those problems. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, stunning presentation. Thank oh, you very thank much. You. I've learned a lot from you. Um, the agriculture sector and the food sector is often really hard to innovate within. And you're putting together some really kind of visionary ideas mm. here. What are the barriers you're facing in, the, in this really well-established, gigantic sector mm. in trying to get your innovations and your ideas yeah. out? Yeah. Um, I think, um, so a couple things. One is um, uh, uh, when you hit land, so it's so cheap in the ocean. When you hit land, it gets really expensive. And so that's where the model is. It requires a whole bunch of capital. It gets very complicated in terms of logistics, storage, freezing, all that sort of stuff. And um, us shifting to that space uh, uh, is, is definitely a problem. It's just hard, right? And it's a, it, it, we've made so much progress because nothing, this just doesn't take much money, right? And so I think that's one piece. The other thing, there's such a push to, to, to in aquaculture to continue growing what people want to eat. Um, which is um, uh, eliminating our opportunities in that, like, you know, permits will become harder. Like, aquaculture is the worst brand name in the grocery store. And this is why I talk about ocean farming. This is a reset of that. Um, so I'm concerned about the, the future of, uh, of permitting. And then people see huge money in the oceans. So I was at the Clinton Global Initiative on, uh, on aquaculture, and it was filled with the soy and corn industry. And I was like, what the hell's going on? Because they want to feed the fish a soy and corn, which is the stupidest thing ever, right? I mean, soy and corn are just completely destructive. We know there's a, you know, we, gotta, we have to use them, but we've got to start shifting off. So there's some, yeah. And, oh, I mean, the last thing is climate change. We're getting growth variation. We never know what's going to come year to year. My solution to that is not creating 1,000-acre farms, rather diversified production in many, many places in a co-op structure with forward contracting. And that's sort of my answer right now to the climate problem. Oh. I think she's had her hands up. Oh. So uh, <clears throat> one of the slides you showed was like the gentleman, like 11th generation yeah. uh, fisherman. Do you see like a lot of adoption from sort of like old world, like farming, like they're excited to try this new thing or yeah. like sort of what is like the reaction to like generational farmers? Yeah. So when I started, I was just getting laughed off the water. I mean, it is totally embarrassing for someone who grew up hunting things and chasing fish to grow vegetables. Like I can't hang out in the same bars anymore, right? I just like, so, and that cultural piece is really key for transition and adoption. Like, and so what I say to fishermen is, um, I mean, first, we're facing the end of fish. They know it. They, maybe they don't talk about it, but we all talk about it privately. Um, uh, so there's that driving force. But we've created a, um, a, a career where at the core of what it is to be a fisherman, to own your own boat, not have a bad boss, succeed and fail on your own terms, have a self-directed life, and the sense of meaning of helping feed the country, like we get to keep those things. These aren't call center jobs. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's less, uh, I don't want to say masculine, but it's less adventurous. But we, these are still jobs we can, what I think of as sing songs about, and that's what we want to do. Um, we, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago, and we had 40 fishermen show up just in a local region, gill netters, lobstermen, all sorts of stuff. And then um, uh, we're having, so we have requests to start farms in every coastal state and province in North America and 40 countries around the world. Like the demand is, just huge, which is absolutely frightening because we're a pretty small organization. Yeah. So I know that we could probably sit here and pick Ren's brain for, forever. We're going to do one more question. Okay. Um, keep in mind that you can also ask questions through Twitter. Um, so specifically, the hashtag for, uh, for Bren is uh, hashtag classy GW. Um, that way, maybe we can answer, question, answer questions afterwards. Wasn't it going to be the least deadliest catch? <laughs> We thought about that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. We had to tie it back to classy yeah, somehow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll do one more question here, and then uh, we'll keep moving. I'm just thinking, help me understand a little about some of the opposition you'll face from uh, maybe the communities that are surrounding these areas, thinking of the Cape Wind Project as yeah. an example of the various bedfellows that came together to try to fight that, and how would you be dealing with those kinds of things? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we had 
duck hunters try to stop one of our farms in Rhode Island, and I had to go explain to them that um, farms love, I mean, ducks love our farms, which means they can get even drunker at six in the morning and kill more ducks, right? So part of it is actually interacting with the stakeholders. Yeah, now we just got that through, so that farm's up, that argument worked. Um, <laughs> but uh, 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 so um, we have a whole stakeholder pr uh, process. We come in very, we pick our spots very carefully. We really work with the community so we know where it is. We start with just two long lines because as soon as people see it, then all that fear goes away. They can see they can boat over it. They see they can dive through the kelp. They can see that it's the best fishing in the entire region now. Um, uh, and then we slowly expand, but also it's uh, why we don't want huge farms, but many small farms, so that there isn't, um, uh, we, we, don't, we just don't run that problem. And then, you know, we designed for aesthetics. This was as much about architecture as it was about farming. And um, uh, just that really light footprint, we've had a lot of less luck. So we're actually permitting faster than anybody else in the country, uh, because I think the way we're entering. Awesome. Well, yeah, right. we're hey, thanks, there. everybody. Thanks Appreciate so much, Ren.